So first of all, how do plants create essential oils? Well, they're in what we call oil glands, and they can be divided into three categories. It's not really important, but hard materials like seeds and woods and sometimes resins have ducts, little channels, and the essential oil forms in these channels. And uh, within the structure of a leaf or a flower, you get little tiny oil glands, and we call those secretory cavities. And glandular trichomes are the ones that are on the outside of a leaf. And I'm going to show you a couple of pictures. So this is a, an orange leaf. And the reason that the French call it petit grain is because of these little tiny dots. And so if you shine a light through any citrus leaf, that's what you see. You see the oil glands uh, showing up as white, little white dots. And they are oil glands within the structure of the leaf. A trichome really is another name for a hair on a plant. A trichome is a hair. And this is a, what they call a glandular trichome, so it's a hair with an oil gland on the end. And this hair is very, very short. So what you see, what you see here, where it says stalk cell, that's the tiny, tiny hair. But in some plants it's longer than that. Uh, and the oil gland is on the end, and that's called a glandular trichome because it's a hair with a gland on the end. And the secretory cells here are the ones that create the essential oil constituents and then secrete them into the secretory cavity where the essential oil exists in the plant. And here are some photographs just from the cover of my book showing different oil glands. So this one is peppermint, this one is sage or clary sage, I can never remember which it is. It's either sage or clary sage. This is ginger and this is tansy. So these ones here, these are the oil glands here. These are um, glandular trichomes. So there's the hair and there's the oil gland on top. So just to give you an idea of what they look like with great magnification. So how does the plant create these things? And this is, I think, very interesting because it, it reflects on what happens in the body and we're going to cover that a little bit later on this morning. Plant cells create essential oil constituents. They don't create essential oils, really. They create essential oil constituents and when those are together in one place, that's what we call an essential oil. And interestingly, each oil gland contains eight secretory cells, just eight, that create the essential oil. Why it's eight every time, I don't know. So in the secretory cell, you have sticky, fluidy stuff that's called the cytosol, and you have little bodies called plastids, and sesquiterpene molecules are created in the cytosol, in the fluid, and monoterpene molecules are created in the plastids. I don't know if that has any cosmic significance. It's just that's what happens. So in the cytosol, this is the kind of pathway of biosynthesis. So biosynthesis means created in the plant or created in nature, as opposed to synthetic, which is you know, man created. So biosynthesis means it's created in nature. And there are different pathways for sesquiterpenes and for monoterpenes. And it's not important for you to remember these words and these names. Uh, but I am going to show you, in a moment, we're going to talk about one or two of them. But this is what we call the biosynthetic pathway. And these are the two kind of basic pathways, and then it can, can get very complicated because there are many, many different constituents, hundreds and hundreds of different constituents, as you know, that can be created. But they all start off in one of these pathways, one of these two pathways. So just to give you an example of a sesquiterpene molecule, alpha bisabolol and a monoterpene molecule, geraniol. And as I'm sure you know, the basic difference is that sesquiterpene molecules have 15 carbon atoms in the molecule. The carbons are not shown with a little c, but they're, they're all there, 15 of them. And uh, monoterpene molecules have 10 carbon atoms, and that's the sort of basic chemical difference between a monoterpene and a sesquiterpene. Now, molecular changes happen through enzymes. I've been hearing discussions on Facebook uh, about how 
Uh, essential oils are very intelligent, which I find an odd phrase. And, you know, the intelligence of essential oils and um, that they can basically adapt to whatever you need. You take an essential oil and then it does whatever you need doing. But, you know, an essential oil can't change itself. It can't transform. The only type of molecule that can do that transformation is what we call an enzyme. And enzymes are very large protein -y molecules. And this enzyme, alpha bisabolol synthase, takes one of these starting molecules, phanosyl diphosphate, and changes it into alpha bisabolol. So it kind of like sucks in the molecule, does its magic, and then spits out a different one. That's how these constituents are created in the plant, by enzymes. And this is what happens when geranyl diphosphate or pyrophosphate, it's the same thing, is transformed into limonene. It's a process that goes through several steps. One, two, three, four steps. This is representing the enzyme and this is the substrate, the, the stuff that's going to be changed, the geranyl pyrophosphate. The enzyme has a certain shape so it can only change certain molecules into certain other molecules. And that's why the enzyme has that name. It's, it does that particular job. And this enzyme is called limonene synthase, or limonene synthase. So these secretory cells have hundreds of enzymes in them, all doing different jobs. Why does nature put so much energy into the creation of these essential oil molecules? So here's an example of some of the molecules found in peppermint oil and the actual pathways that they take. So what we're seeing here is that from at the top geranyl pyrophosphate, limonene is created and then limonene through a different enzyme is changed into isopyritinol. Um, that's changed into isopiperitinone and that's transformed into isopulagone, which is transformed into pulagone, which is transformed into isomenthone. You can't just create isomenthone directly. It has to go through that process. And this is interesting because it helps to explain why essential oils are so complex. It's one of the reasons why essential oils are so complex. So the main constituent in peppermint oil is menthol. But in order to make menthol, the plant has to make all these other things first. And that's my point here. So when you look at the complexity of essential oil, one probable reason for that complexity is that the plant wants to create menthol for whatever reason. I'm going to address the reasons in a moment. The plant wants to create menthol, but in order to do that, it has to go through these different stages. And so some of these constituents, you could say, are left over from the biosynthetic pathway. Maybe the plant wants to create pulagone as well. Maybe it does. I'm, you know, I'm not saying it doesn't but it does kind of help to explain why essential oils are so complex and why we have sometimes, you know, a hundred trace constituents in very, very, very tiny amounts. Perhaps they're just leftovers from these pathways. The amount of a constituent that is created is determined by the genes in the plant, by the genetic profile of the plant. And so when we talk about chemotypes, when we say, you know, this is a thymol chemotype, of time and this is a linalol chemotype of time. The difference is determined by genes in the plant and the genes will instruct the enzymes to create more of this constituent or more of that constituent. So you can, you can actually look at the DNA of a plant and say okay that DNA corresponds to this chemotype. That DNA profile corresponds to this chemotype. This is actually from a tomato leaf which we don't particularly think of as fragrant perhaps, but it does illustrate some of the constituents that we will find in rose or geranium and their pathways. So in order to create citronellol, which is found in citronella, it's found in geranium, it's found in rose, in order to create uh, citronellol, the plant creates geraniol first through an enzyme called geraniol synthase. So each one of these arrows represents a different enzyme. In order to create citronellol, is down here and citronellal is the main constituent of citronella or eucalyptus citriodora. The plant has to go through that 
pathway again. It also kind of explains why in peppermint oil we have menthone, menthol, pulagone, these similar constituents, one being created from the other, and the same here from a tomato leaf to a geranium leaf or a rose flower, you find most of these constituents in all of those because one's being created from the other. It also helps to explain why isomers are often found together because one is created from the other. So you have alpha pinene, beta pinene. You always find them together. You never find one without the other. One may predominate, there may be a greater quantity of alpha pinene or beta pinene in different plants, but you always find them together. Alpha thujone and beta thujone, you always find them together. So just to show you the complexity of a rose from an actual analysis of a specific rose otto, this is just to illustrate that most of the constituents are at less than 1%, a very small amount. So here we're going down to 0.02%. So the numbers are percentages, and I put them in order of percentage. So the greatest percentage is citronellol up here in this particular rose otto. That may not be a typical rose otto. There may be constituents in there that don't occur in some other rose ottos, but they're in there. And if you're familiar with constituents, you will see many familiar names like eugenol, linalol, uh, methyl salicylate here, which is the main constituent of wintergreen oil. You know, and, and most constituents recur in, di in many different oils in different amounts. I don't mean that every constituent is in every oil, but they, you know, the plant's not reinventing the wheel with every essential oil. There are many constituents that occur in many plants. But that's just to show you the complexity of actually a fairly typical essential oil. Citrus oils look that complex. Lavender oil or tea tree oil looks that complex. I know there's this thing that rose oil is much more complex than any other, other essential oil. It isn't. Most essential oils have about 100 constituents, which is what you see here. I think this is 108 or something like that. Some essential oils only have 10 or 20 constituents. They are fairly simple, but that's not typical at all.